How's it going guys? So today we're going to be processing this image. So one of the most common things that I get asked for on the channel is a full start to finish edit and something that's not quite as basic. So today we're going to be processing this. This is a HDR panorama. There's going to be a whole bunch of techniques in this video and it's probably going to take a little bit. So strap in. We're going to be processing this one in Photoshop. Let's jump into it. Okay, so we're gonna start here inside of Lightroom. First of all, the way that I shot this image was I shot this in a three shot bracket because it was a high dynamic range scene. You can see with the darker frames, we have our highlight information, but the shadows are very blocked up and gone. And in the, the neutral exposure, our highlights are gone, especially when we get over to the right side of the frame, you know, in hindsight, I should have shot this even darker. We've blown some of our highlights there. So there's, that's going to be one of the things that we have to fix. I'd only been doing photography for like a year and a half at this point, and I didn't shoot it perfect. But the fact that I have all the raw files originally of, from the original image means that it's one of my favorite images to go back and reprocess because this is still one of the craziest skies I've ever witnessed at this scene. So. This is going to be an HDR set of images. So what we need to do is stitch them to an HDR panorama. We're going to click on the first of the images and then we're going to hold down shift and click on the last set of images or last image. And then we are going to go right click photo merge HDR panorama. So Lightroom makes this incredibly easy to stitch this together. It used to be before they had this HDR panorama feature, you would have to stitch each set of bracketed images to an HDR image. And then you would have to take all of those DNG files that would spit out and stitch that to a panorama. Now we can just select them all and select HDR panorama. It's going to have the full dynamic range of all three of the bracketed Im images but it's also going to stitch them into a panorama and it's going to essentially be a high dynamic range panoramic raw file where we can still access the full dynamic range, change our white balance, do everything we need to do, only it's a panorama. So to start off with, it's gonna give us this little preview here. Typically, you're always going to leave it on spherical and then we have a couple other options. We can fill our edges, we can auto crop, auto settings, create a stack, and we have this boundary warp feature. So you need to be careful with this boundary warp feature, especially when you're doing a wide angle pano like this, because if we start sliding this way to the right, we're going to get some, well, not some, we're going to get quite a bit of distortion on the sides and on the edges here. You can see, like if we look at the waterfall itself, when we slide the boundary warp slider to the right, it's getting very, very tilted and distorted. If we slide it all the way to the left, the water is at least falling down again. So you need to be careful with this slider. You can use it a little bit, but for the most part, some of these edges are gonna get cropped off anyways. So I'm gonna slide this boundary warp slider a little bit to the right. I am not gonna fill edges because that's too much for, uh, for Lightroom to try to calculate, to try to fill. I'm not gonna auto crop and I'm not going to turn on auto settings but I am going to create a stack and then I'm going to hit merge. And then when that's done, it's going to give us this. So this file here is a panorama and it's also got the full dynamic range of those bracketed set of images. If we brighten this up and then look into our deep shadows, we're going to have zero noise and we're going to have all of the highlights ideally um, that we captured because I was a very new photographer. I didn't shoot this properly. What I should have done was started on the brightest side of the sky, brightest side of the panorama, started there, make sure that you're not overexposing your highlights and then pan away from those brightest highlights. So we're gonna have to work with some blown highlights in this frame. So the way we're gonna process this is inside of Photoshop as a smart object. Smart objects are always the way you want to process if you're 
basing your edit off of single image. A smart object essentially just means that you still have access to the raw file. I'm also going to do what's called dual processing a raw file. So I'm going to dual process this, meaning process it once for the shadow information and once for our sky, once for our highlight information, because you often want to treat them differently. A lot of times the shadow areas of a photo need less contrast, but the, the highlights, the skies, they, they need more contrast. They look better with a lot of contrast and they look better darkened down and sometimes they don't need sharpened and a lot of different things. So what we're gonna do is first of all, we're gonna try to get our white balance, right? I'm gonna bring down the exposure and kind of check out how the sky looks with different white balances. And I'm just gonna slide our temperature slider and our tint slider around until we have a nice balance between warm tones and cool tones. I'm looking at those kind of electric blues in that sky. I want to maintain those, but I also don't want it to be just a wash of blue like this. So I'm kind of sliding this around to, a, to, to where I find a happy medium. The other thing I want to do is because we shot this with a wide angle lens, you get an effect called pancaking. So it, essentially what it is is anything in the center of a wide angle frame, like if you're shooting this at 16 millimeters, envision someone's head, that head is going to get squished in the middle. You know, things in the center of a wide angle frame get squished, things on the outside get stretched. So in this case, our waterfall, which is, this is actually like a 90 foot tall waterfall fall, it's getting squished a little bit because it's in the center of a wide angle frame. So one of the things that I want to do is go down to the transform section in Lightroom and I'm going to go to this aspect. And what we can do here is start sliding this to the right and you can see what it's doing is stretching things out vertically. Essentially what that's doing is getting rid of some of that wide angle distortion. So a couple of negatives that's happening here is that we're starting to lose the top and the bottom of the frame. And we can fix that with a scale slider just by sliding the scale slider slightly to the left. We can also tip the tip the frame forward and backwards and see if that's going to help with some of that distortion. So something like this is actually giving us a pretty balanced frame where our water is still falling down. It's not falling out. That's one of the reasons I shot this as a panorama but we're also losing some of that wide angle distortion and that waterfall is not getting pancaked as bad. So now I'm going to lift our shadows, lift our blacks and bring down our exposure. The reason I'm doing this is because I want this to be for kind of the shadow information area of the frame. I would like to treat my shadows in a more uh, low contrast way. That way I can have them nice and dark but we're not losing information. And then I'm going to, I'm going to work some highlights back into these areas. That way we have areas of highlights that are really drawing the eye. Highlights are only impactful if they're next to dark or deep shadows. And that way our highlights can be higher contrast. I'm going to go down to our detail sliders and I'm going to decrease the radius of the sharpening, increase the detail, and mask out a little bit of the sharpening. That way we're only, we're only sharpening details. And then at this point, I'm ready to open this up inside of Photoshop. I'm going to right click, edit in, open a smart object in Photoshop. And that's going to open this file up inside of Photoshop where we still have access to all of our raw file data. Okay, inside of Photoshop, the first thing I can do is start to bring in some of these edges that we don't need. And now this is going to be for the shadow areas of the image. Now what we need to do is create another version of this file for the highlight areas. So the sky, the waterfall, things like that. So what we're going to do is right click over here on the title of this layer. So we're going to right click and go up to new smart object via copy. That's going to create another copy of this smart object but they're not going to be linked. If I was to just duplicate that layer, those files would be linked. And when you edit one, it would change the other as well. Now these are two separate files. It's really important when opening anything up as a smart object. So we're gonna double click on this top layer here. That's going to bring up Adobe Camera Raw. And you can see that we have all of our same adjustments that we had that we did inside of Lightroom. 
So in this version of the photo, I'm going to add contrast, bring down the exposure a bit, because really what we're looking at is the sky here. And there's definitely going to be some repair needed in those blown highlight areas. But this, this sky is crazy enough that this frame is worth a little bit of extra work. So basically I'm just adding contrast, um, adding contrast, bringing down exposure, not lifting our blacks or our shadows. That way we're maintaining all of that contrast. Another thing is that typically in my sky areas of the frame, I don't want to add sharpening because all you're really sharpening is noise. So I'm going to remove the sharpening and add a little bit of noise reduction. That way we have a nice smooth sky with zero noise and then hit OK. So now we have a flat version of the photo for the shadow areas and we have a high contrast version of the photo for that sky. Now we need to blend them in together. So the first thing I'm going to do is put a layer mask on this top version of the photo, which is for our sky. I'm going to invert that layer mask by going Controller Command I. Grab a paintbrush, 100% opacity, paint with white, and I'm going to start at the top of the frame here. And I'm going to start to bring it down towards the horizon. That looks pretty good. The next thing I'm going to do is grab a selection of our sky. That way we can use that selection as kind of a stencil. That way we're not accidentally um, bringing this paint down onto our landscape. So we're going to go up to Select Sky. And that's going to make a selection of the sky. And I find that Photoshop's selection of the sky is very much dependent on how sharp that edge is. In this case, it should do an excellent job. And just looking at our marching ants, it looks like it's done a pretty good job. So we're going to go back to our layer mask. I'm going to hit Control or Command H for hide. And that's going to hide those marching ants. And then using that selection as a stencil, I'm just going to finish off this quick exposure blend. So bring that down to the horizon. If I hold down Alter Option and look at our layer mask, you can see what this looks like. And we can double check and make sure that we don't have any dark haloing happening on our horizon. To me, that looks pretty good. The way that I process is after every step, I stop and analyze the photo and I'm, I ask myself, okay, what's wrong with it? What bothers me? What's next? So there's two things that really bother me right now. Our waterfall is very dull and flat. We need to add some contrast to that. There's not a lot of dimension on some of these cliff sides that I want to draw attention to. And we have these blown highlights here that, that frankly don't look very good. And we obviously have all these empty pixels. We'll take care of that later. So the first thing I want to do is let's go ahead and brighten this waterfall up. Now I'm going to show you a technique here that I call guided dodging and burning. So I'm going to create a new dodge burn layer and the, the, all a dodge burn layer is, is a new layer with the blend mode changed to soft light. And this, if I just paint, paint pixels somewhere, let's go 10% opacity. You can see that it, it will brighten if I have a bright color or it'll darken if I have a dark color selected, right? But the problem with that is that I have to I have to be very careful about where I paint because if I'm whoops if I'm brightening let's grab this color if I'm brightening like this and then I accidentally go into a shadow area you can see that there's nothing to keep me from going into those shadows so what I can do is I can grab a selection of my brightest tones. And that's going to function like a stencil to keep me painting only into the highlights. This is called guided dodging and burning. I'm going to use a luminosity mask. So to use luminosity masks, you can either use something like TK Actions or Lumenzia. These are just luminosity mask creation tools. I'm going to use TK Actions in this case. And all I want to do is grab a selection of a black and white version of our photo. And that's just a luminosity mask. But in this case, we're not using it as a mask, we're using it as a selection. And anything that you have selected, kind of like that sky selection, it's gonna function like a stencil. So we're going to make a selection with this button here, a selection of our brighter tones. It's a selection of our black and white version of our photo. And now when I paint 
that brighter color here. It's allowing the paint to go into the waterfall, but it's not allowing it to go into the shadow areas. Because remember, with selections, white reveals black and seals, or with layer masks, white reveals black and seals. And the same is true when you have a selection active. It, it'll allow, allow paint to go into the white areas, and it'll deny the paint to, from going into the shadow areas. So a black and white version of the photo allows the paint to go into the highlights and keeps them out of the shadows. Luminosity Mask 101. So I'm just using this selection to allow my dodging to go into those highlights, but keep me out of the shadow areas. So when you're doing this, it feels like you're not doing much because it's happening slow. But if I turn this off and on before, after, it's actually adding quite a lot of pop and attention to that waterfall. The color that I'm using is actually close to white, but it's got just a little bit of warmth. The reason for that is because, you know, the, the reflected light from the sunset is very warm. So I want that warmth to be reflected in that water. It wouldn't make any sense if it was blue because that wouldn't be getting reflected onto the water. So I'm just gonna use this dodge burn layer to add some highlights to some of the areas that should have some highlights. This rock face here, because it's pointed or it's facing the, the west, it should be catching a little bit of that light, more so than it does in this version because we decrease the contrast so much. So we need to add some of that highlight back in. You might be asking yourself, why did we flatten the image if we're just going to do this to it? And the reason we flattened it is because now we're in full control over where the highlights are going to be. We're in full control over where the viewer's eye is going to go. And when you're in full control over stuff like that, you're in control over the visual flow of your image. That way you can have highlights where they help the composition, but keep the highlights out of the areas where it might, you know, be a distraction or, or you know, lead the viewer's eye outside of the frame. It wouldn't make any sense to have your brightest highlights right on the edge of your frame because the viewer's eye is just going to go zoop straight out the side of the frame. Okay, so now we have fixed some of the flatness of that foreground. We have lots of interest down here. The next thing I want to do is try to repair this, this blown out area. So we're gonna create a new layer. And for, in this case, I'm going to leave the blend mode on normal. So this is not gonna be a dodge burn layer. This is gonna be literally just a paint layer. And what we're gonna do is we're going to sample the color that is happening by holding down alt or option right next to these brightest highlights, like so. And that gives me my little eyedropper. And you can see that we're almost at white but not quite. And what we're gonna do is with a very low opacity and a low flow, so 10% opacity, 60% 60, 60 flow, I'm going to paint just a little bit of that color into this area here. We can grab a slightly darker color, more saturated color, and work that into this area here. And what we're doing is we're softening this transition from saturated to white. And by softening that transition, we're essentially faking clouds. So before, after. And that is far less offensive to the eye because, because the harsh transition from white to saturated just makes it obvious that we blew our highlights. But if we soften and feather that transition, it makes it, it makes it less apparent that we screwed up. So I'm going to overdo this intentionally. And then what we can do is just back off the opacity of this layer. That way it's a subtle thing. We don't want, we don't want that area to be flat. We still want it to get all the way to white. In fact, maybe we'll grab white and then just do a couple quick little dabs close to the edge there. That way we still have a transition that happens. 
but it's a far less harsh transition. And that just kind of mellows that area out. Up until this point, we've been working with these smart object layers. And the, the problem with smart object layers is that they don't allow you to clone on them. You can't stretch them because they're not pixel layers. Pixel layers you can stretch and you can clone on, but you can't do that with smart object layers. And now we need to do some content to wear fill areas. We need to stretch some areas and you can't do that. So at this point, we're going to create our first destructive layer. And that's a merge visible layer. A merge visible layer is the current state of your photo on its own pixel layer. So we're going to go Control Shift Alt E or Command Option Shift E on a Mac. And that's going to give us this layer here. You can see nothing's changed with our photo, but now we have pixels to mess with. So I'm going to start off by cropping in a bit on our frame. We're going to lose some of these bottom corners, something like this. And now we're going to start working on filling some of these areas around the outside. So this top is going to be pretty easy to work with. I'm going to grab my rectangular marquee tool, make a selection of the top portion of the photo, hit Control or Command T for transform. And then I'm going to hold down Shift and grab this top control point and then just drag up. And that just allows us to stretch this up and I'm just stretching it up to where we don't have any more empty pixels like that. So we still have some on the corners, but the top part of the frame is fixed. So I'm going to do the same thing with this bottom portion. So I got the rectangular marquee tool, control or command T for transform, hold down shift. The reason you have to hold down shift is if I grab this without holding down shift, you can see it just grows it. You know, it stretches it in every direction but we need to stretch it only vertically. So I'm going to hold down shift, and stretch this down. And I'm just going to do it about to here because I want to try to maintain this, this edge, this border. And then I'm going to hit okay. So at this point, we can try to do a little bit of that on these corners. So I'm going to grab this section here with a rectangular marquee tool, hit controller command T. And now, we can't really just stretch this sideways because, well, maybe we can do it a little bit. Let's do just that much. Hit enter when we're done. But we need to do the rest of this either with a content aware fill, which will probably work, or we can try to warp these areas. So let's start on this side because this side has people, which people are really easy to tell when they've been messed with. So I'm going to grab this side here. I'm going to hit control or command T for transform. I'm going to right click and select warp. So now we can actually stretch and move stuff around a little bit. And I we can minimize the amount of area we have to do content to wear fill on if we just stretch stuff over. I don't want things to get too stretched out because then they're going to look pretty funky but I'm going to stretch it a little bit simply because that'll be less area that we have to just fake some pixels and the less, the less we have to fake the better. I'm going to hit enter when I'm done. And now we just have some smaller areas there that we'll have to fill. Let's do this section down here. Controller command T right click warp, grab this, and stretch it down like so. That looks pretty good. So now we just have some empty pixels around the edges here and we're gonna try to just fill these. So I'm gonna grab my lasso tool, just make a little selection, right click, content aware fill, and then we're going to have to paint paint around the areas that you want Photoshop to mimic. So this is where it's going to draw its selection from. Over here is going to be our preview. So you can see that it's been filled in over here. That looks pretty good to me. I'm going to hit OK. And then we'll inspect our job. So before, after, did a pretty good job. You can do the same thing down here. 
like so with the lasso tool. And we're going to make sure that this layer is selected because if one of these other layers is selected, there's not actually pixels there for it to fill. So we're going to right click, go to content aware fill. Then we're going to show Photoshop what we want it to mimic. So just these areas here, you want to paint or you want it to look at areas that are very similar to what you want to be there. And then we get a preview over here. That looks really good. Hit OK. Control or Command D to deselect that area. That looks good. We'll do the same thing over here. Make sure that our pixel layer here, layer three, is selected. We're going to right click, Content Aware Fill, and we're going to paint the area that we want Photoshop to draw from. Hit OK. Controller Command D, boom. We have a frame with no empty pixels. Okay, so at this point we have an image that is, is fully formed. Now the next step is we need to figure out what's next, what's bothering us. I feel like we could benefit from a little extra contrast in our, in our foreground areas around the waterfall, but also we have a really bright portion of the sky and by looking at this, it looks tiny bit blown out, unfortunately. And the joys of trying to fix a, a photo that isn't quite right. So what we need to do is we need to do a little bit more content aware fill up here, just so we have some actual sky to work with here. Because if we try to just darken it down, it's just gonna be desaturated and wrong looking. So let's try, let's try something. Let's create a new layer. We'll leave the blend mode changed to normal. And we could try to content aware fill it, but most likely it's just going to add more blown out area. So I think we need to actually use our clone stamp tool. So I'm going to select the clone stamp tool, change the blend mode to normal, but I want the opacity of this to be not, not 100% because we're gonna be drawing from some pretty dark, uh, some areas that are darker than this. So I'm going to hold down Alt and select this kind of just open textureless area here. We're going to, with a nice large paintbrush, just make a little pass. And that looks a lot better, but we do have kind of an obvious transition zone here. Also, another thing is that you want to make sure you're not selecting something that is going to be really obvious if it's repeated. So like if we sampled that and then painted it over here, it's going to be really obvious that that is a duplicated cloud. So that's why it's, you're better off to, to make a sampling from something that's fairly textureless. So before, after, you can see we've just added a little bit of sky into that area. We can try to darken this area a little bit more. Sample from here. Nice large brush. Something like that. And now what we can do in these areas that don't look quite right, or there's an obvious transition zone there, is that we can go in here with a layer mask, switch to black, 20% opacity brush, grab a paintbrush, 100% flow. And because we're using black, we can just kind of soften that transition zone. So I'm just doing a couple clicks around the edge of that before, after. Just a couple clicks to feather that transition into those essentially painted pixels. Because we, we want this to be as natural and unnoticeable as possible. We can even play with the opacity of this layer. That way it's subtle as subtle as what we're going for here. So before, after, could be a little better. So let's go back to our clone stamp tool, sample from here, and then just do one click and play with the density of that layer, something like that. So at least up here now we have some legitimate sky <laughs> rather than just blown out highlights there. Okay, next thing we need to do 
is let's add a little bit of pop down in this foreground. So let's go, let's create a new levels adjustment. And just looking in this area, I want to bring this right slider to the left, mid-tone slider to the right. I don't want the mid-tones to get any brighter. I just want them, I just want the highlights to get brighter. So we're actually adding contrast rather than just brightening. So when I turn this off and on, you can see that the mid-tones are pretty much getting left alone before, after. Okay, gonna invert that layer mask, grab our paintbrush, 30% opacity, and we'll just paint a little bit of that. Make sure we got a soft brush. Paint a little bit of that into the areas that we want to add a little bit of highlight kick to. Boom, boom. All right, the next thing that I would like to do is let's embellish this light that's streaming in a little bit. So let's grab a new layer, change the blend mode to soft light. So it's just a standard dodge burn layer. And then with a nice bright warm color, 20% opacity brush. We're just going to use the feather end of this brush and just kind of work a little bit of that, that feathered light into this portion of the scene. We've got this little water drop here. And I think that just by adding a little bit of feathering around it, it makes it a little less offensive. All right, so at this point, I wanna do my typical Gaussian blur effect. So create a merge visible layer, go up to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. I'm gonna blur it uh, probably somewhere around 60 pixels because this is a panorama. I'm gonna change the, blend, uh, change the opacity of this layer to 22%. We're going to go up to TK Actions, grab a Lights One Luminosity Mask, and apply it to that blurred layer. And then we're going to open up that Gaussian Blur layer in Adobe Camera Raw, and we're going to add some warmth, brightness, and contrast. So basic panel, contrast, exposure, warmth. It's just gonna make those highlights a little bit extra warm, a little bit extra glowy. So before, after. It's not extreme, it's not too crazy. The other thing I wanna do is add just a little sense of depth. So to get, a, to get that sense of depth, you need to have more contrast close to camera and less contrast far away. So I'm just gonna grab a new curves layer I'm gonna grab this left side and just drag it up just a tiny bit. So before, after. And all that's doing is kind of opening up those deepest shadows. We're gonna invert the layer mask on that. We're going to make our brush normal again. And then with a white paintbrush, 40% opacity, just do a few clicks in that background area here. Things far away from camera should be less contrasty than things close to camera. That whole background there should have more atmosphere between us and us and the camera, or us and it, before, after. Just adding a little bit of that sense of atmosphere. So let's look at this both totally before and after. We went from this to this. I tried to emphasize that sense of depth. I tried to fix those blown highlights. Yeah, maybe it worked, but you can see why I keep coming back to this image because like when I took this image, I couldn't, I couldn't really make it work very well. The, the combination of it being a panorama and high dynamic range and all this crazy saturation that's in the raw file, you know, already, it looked really cartoony the first couple, well, you could argue it still looks cartoony, I guess, but it, it was a struggle to process. And it's always fun to go back and reprocess an old image because this was a special day, you know, that I've never seen a sky quite that crazy, especially at this location since. So it's fun for me to go back and reprocess this. Hopefully there's some inspiration in there somewhere. It gives you an idea into, you know, the way I process and, and some of the techniques that I use. And hopefully you guys gleaned something from this. So again, here is the final image. And I hope that you guys are all well. Take it easy, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed this and we'll catch you later.